guys it's Charlie I hope you're all well so this is gonna be my first ever author spotlight video and I'm super excited about this because it's something that I've wanted to do in for a long quite a long time and when I mentioned about it it got such a good response from you guys like yeah we'd really like to see that so I'm super excited that I'm finally doing it with you and the author I'm going to be speaking about today is drumroll please Ransom Riggs I know this will come as no surprise to you guys, and I've probably got these upside down, have I? No, I haven't. That's surprising. Um, this will come as no surprise to you guys. I'm always spouting about him, but I just need to share my love even more about Ransom Riggs because he's amazing. So, um, I first came across Ransom Riggs a long, long, long time ago when I found Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Um, I read this before all the hype started going about with it. It was after it first came out. And I was actually searching for books that were set in children's homes. Now, I know that sounds weird, but um, at the time I was obsessed with Tracy Beaker. don't know if any of you know about that, but in the UK it's about this girl and her life in a children's home. And I just find it really fascinating and stuff. Um, that kind of thing. I've always wanted to work in that kind of area and I was looking for books in that and this came up and I thought oh I like the look of that cover and I thought it was going to be a horror which it's kind of a little misleading because it isn't I wouldn't say it's a horror um and so I picked it up and it came and I saw all the pictures um going through it and I was like I'm gonna love this book I mean oh I was just like, yeah, I'm going to really enjoy this. And I started I started reading it straight away. And I was just sucked in to this world and to Ransom Riggs's writing. And from that moment on, I knew that I was going to have to have everything by him. His writing is just magical. I, I don't think there are any other writers like him. That's just my opinion. But... I have never come across books like his they are so different and magical and when you read his books you go into a completely different world and I know you get that with a lot of books that's what books are for taking you into another world but his truly are you forget about everything else you're just sucked into these characters these characters that are Obviously they're peculiar, they have their own skills, but they're so real and you're just, you're rooting for them, you're really rooting for them, you feel really invested in them. Um, for those of you who haven't read these books, you need to read them, I just want to start by saying that. But they follow this boy called Jacob, who, when he was younger, his granddad used to tell him these stories about this place that he was brought up in and the peculiar children he lived with there. And Jacob just kind of thinks, at first he believes they're real, but as he grows up, he sort of thinks, oh, they're just stories, they're not real. And then his father, his grandfather, sorry, is killed by this beast. And in his dying words, he says to Jacob to go and find the bird in the loop. And so Jacob sets off to this little island to basically see if what his granddad had been saying was true not really thinking it would be but it turns out that and I don't think this is really a spoiler but these peculiar children are still alive and his grandfather's stories were very much true and that's all I want to say because I don't really want to tell you it too much more um but it just goes off into this magical adventure of survival and the, all the different characters that you meet just Oh, I can't rave about these books enough. And of course, Hollow City just came out, which I just finished recently reading. And it was even better than the first one, which I didn't think was possible. But it surpassed itself. I was... I, I just didn't want it to end. I just did not want it to end. I was left in this dejected Ransom Riggs... Need. I can't speak highly enough about these and Ransom Riggs' is writing. It's just phenomenal. I love him more than I can say and I can't wait to see where he goes next this series he's definitely a writer that you should check out without a doubt because you won't find anyone else like him um 
as I say, his books are littered with gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. And what I also love about them as well, it must have taken him so long to work his stories around these pictures because there are no pictures in these books that are surplus to requirements. Like, they all fit in. There's not one where you think, what was that really about? Here and here, where they go to this peculiar, well, it's a carnival really, um, and they see this guy that is ridiculously skinny, look at that, um, and he can like bend and all this stuff, and it's just amazing how he has come up with these characters just by these pictures. I can't talk about this series enough, and I can't believe I'm going to have to wait now to see where he goes with it, because I need more, I need more. Um, I just love it so much. Um, one of his books that he's done, it's a picture book really, one of my favourite books that I own, and I am constantly looking through it, and just it's just wonderful, and it's called Talking Pictures, and I know I've spoke about this before, um, but basically, Ransom Riggs is, um, the reason that he puts all these pictures into his books and stuff is because he has a fascination with going around car boots and yard sales and things like that and buying old photographs. Um, and particularly old photographs with like little pieces of writing on them. You know, like when you take a photo, you write on the back like who's in it and what was going on that particular day. And he has put some of these pictures that he's found in this book and the little messages they have on them. And it's split into sections as well. Um, so you've got like humorous ones and you've got sad ones. And it's just breathtaking looking at the stories and thinking and just imagining what was going on at that time and how that person felt and really as well it just goes to show that we're the same really as it was back then like as people we're all striving for the same thing and it's just so beautiful and there is one in particular here where he must have picked up like this whole bunch of photos of this young girl um and her name is you know, her name is Janet Lee, and there is about quite a few pictures of her, and it s starts in the beginning like this, and then it goes, oh, I hope you can see me, I've gone a bit low down now, um, and it goes all the way along, and this girl didn't live very long, obviously, and um, it kind of goes through, and it says about like, for example, this one says Janet in hospital just before going for her x-rays. And then it goes all the way along her little life. And then, as you can see, there's quite a lot of this little girl's pictures. And then it says here, Janet Lee, after last fall on bedroom floor, looks so pathetic with swollen bridge between her eyes. Seven x-rays on May 30th at Abbott Hospital told no broken bone should buy a helmet for her. And then, as I say, it goes all the way along. And then the very last picture is this little girl in her coffin. And then it says, Janet was 10 years old. And that's when she died. And I remember when I first read it, and it took my breath away. It just was, it just took my breath away. And I can't... I just can't tell you how beautiful this book is and you need it in your collection. Um, if you like photography, sorry I'm not very comfortable down here. Um, if you like photography or just, I even if you don't, it's just so interesting looking at these other people's photos. It's amazing. And he's wrote this bit at the beginning which I thought I'd end this video reading because I think it's beautiful. I have an unusual hobby. I collect pictures of people I don't know. It started when I was a kid growing up in South Florida, the land of junk stores, garage sales and flea markets, as a kind of coping mechanism. Despite my best efforts to avoid them, I was often dragged along on Sunday afternoon antiquing expeditions, down dim and dusty aisles crowded with needlepoint portraits and moth-eaten sports coats, a hellscape for any boy of 13, where occasionally, while my grandmother hunted for bargains, I would find caches of old snapshots. There were photos of strangers, of weddings, of funerals, 
family vacations, backyard forts and first days of school, all torn from once treasured albums and dumped into plastic bins for strangers to pour through. Communal graves of sort, the anonymous dead shuffled into ersatz families of the unwanted. I spent hours sifting through the bins, their faces blackening my fingertips. What fascinated me about them, even more than the images themselves at first, was they were available for sale. I wondered how people could give away pictures of their families, even those of distant relatives they might not know or remember. Why would they give these photographs up? Why? For what matter would complete strangers want them? The first question was almost too grim to ponder. As for why people want them, I began to understand it. The first time a snapshot really caught my eye. It was a portrait of a pretty girl who bore an uncanny resemblance to someone I'd suffered a hopeless crush on at summer camp. I found her smiling up at me from a shoebox, encased in a little cardboard frame, and knew in an instant that she was destined to become my fantasy girlfriend. I ponied up a quarter, took her home, and propped her on her on my nightstand, where for the better part of a year she occupied a hallowed spot between cardboard likenesses of Nolan Ryan and Ken Griffey Jr. It was fun to wonder who she was and what her life might have been like. When I finally outgrew baseball cards and fantasy girlfriends, I decided to retire them from my nightstand into a proper album. But the girl's picture wouldn't fit because of its cardboard frame. Ever so carefully, as if performing important surgery, I pried it out. Turning it over in my hands, I saw the back for the first time. For a long while, I just sat on the edge of my bed, staring at it. I'd spent months imagining a life for this person, and in an instant it was all erased. She was no longer anonymous. Now she had a name, Dorothy, and a city and a fate. I'd been fantasising about a dead girl. I found myself grieving in a small, quiet way for a person I had never known, who had been dead now much longer than she had been alive, and whose own family had probably not thought of her in decades. Smiling and doomed, Dorothy haunted me for some time. Fifteen years passed before I bought another snapshot. Once I crossed that threshold, my, ho my old hobby blossomed into an obsession. I became a collector, albeit an odd one. My primary interest was in snapshots that had writing on them. This had advantages and disadvantages. Among other things, by looking at only the backs of the photos, I could sort through a bin of a thousand snapshots in just a few minutes. Dorothy taught me that a great snapshot doesn't have to meet the aesthetic standards by which we judge other types of photography. A photo might seem absolutely ordinary, but for a few words scribbled on the opposite side. As a kid, I found it hard to believe that photos of my grandmother as a young girl, posing stiffly in a sepia-toned world, could actually have been taken during her lifetime. They seemed like artefacts from some ancient civilization. That's because old photos have a way of looking older than they really are, focusing on our attentions on all that outmoded and obsolete technology, styles of dress and other such cultural ephema. Great inscriptions have the opposite effect. They allow us to recognise something of ourselves in the blurred and yellow faces of our forebearers. By echoing something timeless, they remind us of all that hasn't changed, the ache of long-distance love, the anxiety felt by parents sending their children off to war, that everyone, at one time or another, has felt conscious about the way they look in pictures. If any of these snapshots I can speak, can speak, I think what they say is, things aren't so different. Sometimes a word is worth a thousand pictures.